anymore. No one calls, no one writes, no one texts, no one sends an email, no U.S. mail, no one stops by to visit, no one knows if I'm even dead or alive. Does those incantations, does that sound ridiculous? Well, actually, it is if you don't feel that way. Those incantations are not ridiculous if you do feel that way. You see, I was reading a very interesting article, and it was talking about the grass, fastest growing segment of the American population of those who suffer from loneliness. Loneliness, in many ways, is a killer. Now, we're not talking about sporadic loneliness. Sporadic loneliness is something that all of us enjoy. It, you know, it's that 15, 20 minutes in the morning when you're by yourself, the house is quiet, you have your coffee and your thoughts, and you're just, it's nice and peaceful. What makes sporadic loneliness so nice is that you know it's not going to last. Before long, your life will, and your day will be filled with a lot of people. The trouble is when sporadic loneliness becomes permanent loneliness, you go from what you desire to what you despise. And the very interesting thing about loneliness, you don't have to be with a bunch of people to feel lonely. Although we have a lot of people in church tonight, there's a really good chance that, that we have people here tonight that feel lonely despite the fact that you are in the middle of all these people. A friend of mine was telling me about his little son, Johnny, when Johnny went to his first camping trip. When Johnny went to his first camping trip, at the end of that first day, he and his wife get a text from Johnny. And Johnny texts his mom and dad and said this, Mom and dad, there are 50 boys at this camp. How do I wish there are only 49? Love, lonely Johnny. You see, he was lonely. There were 49 other boys but he wasn't able to usurp his loneliness where all those around him. That turns out to be the key point of today's gospel reading. It is said in life that if you have one friend your entire life, you should consider yourself lucky. And there's one way that every one of us in church tonight can have one very important friend. And I'll show you how. Now the gospel reading comes out of the 12th chapter of John, verses 20 to 33 inclusive. What we want to look at is verse 20. So let's look at verse 20 of the 12th or 2nd chapter of John. It says some Greeks who had come to worship at the feast, Passover feast came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Now, there were 12 original disciples, apostles. Philip was one of them. These Greeks could have went to any one of those 12, but purposely, specifically, they went to Philip. They went to Philip for one reason and one reason only. Why do you think they, they sought out Philip? Any idea? Exactly right. They went to Philip because Philip was the only one of the apostles that they knew. You see, if you have the wish of a favor to be granted, you say to yourself, what connections do I have? And you're going to go to the person you're, you have a connection with. If you know someone, you're going to go to that person and say to that person, can you do me a favor? Philip was the only one of the 12 apostles they knew and so they thought to themselves, we want to see Jesus. We're going to go to the guy that we know, Philip. Now, there's a reason why Philip was also sought out. You see, Philip was gregarious. Philip was outgoing. Philip had this incredible personality. Not everyone is blessed with these outgoing, incredible personalities, but those who are have a tendency to know a lot of people because people gravitate they're those type of personalities. They're magnetic. And that was Philip. He was the socialite. Many people called him the social butterfly. Everywhere he went, people knew him. He did very important. And what he did is in verse 21. Let's take a look. Verse 21, again, second Philip went and told Andrew, and this is when they asked the Greeks, can, can you allow us to see Jesus? Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Now that seems like a very insignificant nuance, but it is critical for the type of personality that Philip had. You know, Philip, he didn't have to go ask Andrew. He could have did this on his own. He was outgoing. He wasn't a kind of embarrassed fella. He could just go over and see Jesus. They, these Greeks want me to ask you a favor. But Philip said to himself, you know, I got to walk on foot. He wasn't able to take the car, didn't have any cars, so I got a long way to go to see Jesus. And 
and maybe someone will go along with me. So he went to see Andrew and basically said, Andrew, look, uh, would you like to travel with me to see Jesus? You and I can walk and talk together as we're going to see Jesus. You see, that's key. Philip people a part of his life, but apart from his life. He included people into his life. I am positive Philip was never the kind of guy to suffer from loneliness because he reached out to people. Now that's the challenge for all of us here this morning. On one of my communion calls that I take monthly, this one communion call, I've been going to this lady's house for years, and when I get to the house, she doesn't have a doorbell, so I have to knock real hard. Matter of fact, there's a note on the door that says, and it's pretty tethered, knock hard. And then she'll yell out, come in. Now, when I open up the door, to the left is the kitchen, to the right is the living room. This lady is always on a recliner in the living room. So I walk into the living room, and I sit on a couch right next to this lady, and we have a nice conversation. And then I eventually will give her communion and a little bit more conversation, and then I leave. On the wall opposite me, she has this big wall in her living room that has all kind of pictures and knickknacks, and it's a really busy wall. And I, I see that wall from the couch all the time, every month, once a month. And what I enjoy is right there in the center of that wall, there's this huge picture. It's got to be 16 inches by 20 inches. And it just, it, I see it all the time. And written above the picture says this, with Jesus, you are never alone. Now that's nice, that's a good thought. But below that, there's a lot of writing inside of this picture. And I always wonder, what does that say? What is the story below that? With Jesus, you are never alone. And every time when I go to our house, I always say to myself, I'm going to take the time to walk over, look at that picture, and read it. But I start talking to her, then I give her communion, then we talk more, and I leave, and I get in the car and say, I forgot to read that, what's written there. It was last week one day when I'm at her house, and I'm sitting there, we're conversing, and I see that picture, and I'm thinking, what you'd like to know what it says. And then she wanted to show me some family pictures. But she told me they're back in the bedroom somewhere. She was going to go back there and get them. So she left the living room and she's back looking for these pictures. She's a long time in coming back. And I thought to myself, this is a perfect time to do some snooping around here. <laughs> I always wanted to case out this house and see what all is going on in this place. And, and I walked over to that picture. And then I read it. And it's a very beautiful story written by an American Indian, a Cherokee. And he writes this story about the rite of passage from boyhood to manhood for the Cherokee Indian. And he starts off by saying that when you are at that age, it's time to become a man. One of the things that the Cherokee Indians do to you is that they blindfold you. The tribal leader takes you deep into the woods, a couple of miles into the woods, and they put you down on this stump with the blindfold on, and then you have to stay there the entire night. And the tribal leader leaves. And you're all alone, all night long. And then after he explains the rite of passage from boyhood to manhood, then he explains how this happened on his night of rite of passage. He said he was blindfolded by the tribal leader, taken into the woods. They walked forever. They went about what felt like two miles into the woods. And the tribal leader told him to bend down and sit. There's a stump right there. And he helped him sit on the stump. And then a tribal leader said to him, you have to keep the blindfold on. And when the sun comes up and it washes your face and you can feel the warmth of the sun touching your face, bathing you, then you can re remove the blindfold. And now you have gone from boyhood to manhood. And the leader left. Now he writes the story that when he was sitting on that stump, he was horrified, so scared. It's dark, not only because it's dark outside, he's got this blindfold on, it's, you, you can't see a thing. He said, it's absolutely amazing the noises the forest makes at night. 
two branches rubbing up against each other in the middle of the night, an incredible sound. He said it, it might have been the sound of an acorn falling from the tree, but at night when you're woods, of an acorn falling through the trees, landing on the ground, an incredible scary sound. And then he writes in this story on that there are so many nocturnal animals and critters and creatures and they all make these strange sounds. And the owl is the strangest of all the sounds. That hoot is just a, a scary, scary sound. He said all night long all he wanted to do was rip off that blindfold and run out of those woods. But he held firm. He kept the blindfold on. Scared, as scared as can be. And in the morning when the sun rose, started to bathe his face, he could feel the warmth of the sun rays, on he removed the blindfold. And when he looked to the left, there was his father sitting on the stump right next to him. And he said to his father, his dad, he said, Dad, father, when did you get here? And the father said, I've been sitting here, and I watched a tribal leader bring you to this spot, for I knew this leader, he would take you. I have been here all night long, watching you, taking care of you, making sure that nothing would happen to you. And since he didn't realize that, he was able to move from boyhood to manhood. And this beautiful story ends and puts us all together and says this. If you invite Jesus into your life, and that's what Philip did with Andrew. Philip could have traveled all alone by himself. He did not need Andrew. But he thought to himself, I want to make sure that I make people a part of my life. He said, Andrew, you, you, you want to go for a walk with me? i got to go over there and talk to Jesus. And they went together. And this article below this story said this. It, it works the same way with us. In our life, when you find yourself struggling and you're going through a period of darkness and you're lonely and it's nighttime figuratively in your life and you're scared and you're worried and you're wondering whether or not you can make it to morning, what you always have to know is this, that your Father, God our Father, sits right next to you. If you have taken the time in your life to invite Jesus into your life, God into your life, then you are never, ever alone. And that's true. I did a funeral for a friend of mine some years ago. He left a Christmas party over in a town of Latrobe. And he had to park some distance from where the event was being held. And when he got to his car, unbeknownst to anyone else, because he was so far removed from when everywhere else had parked their car, he had a massive heart attack. And he fell to the ground and he died between two cars, his and the other. He wasn't found till in the morning. When I remembered the funeral, when I went to the funeral home, his mom, all she could think about is he died alone despite the fact that he had a wife and two daughters, but he died alone, and that was painful. The funeral home, and it was the good Lord, it was him, it was him, because I'm just, I'm not smart enough to think about this quickly. But when I got there, and she held onto my hand, and her son and I were friends from the first grade, literally, every grade, first grade to 12th grade, until we separated to do our own thing. And she said to me, Father Ken, my, my son, he died alone. And the good Lord said to me to tell her this. He did not die alone. He did not die alone. He, she, he did. He fell between two cars, had a massive heart attack, spent the whole night there. He died alone. No. Your son, because I knew him well, Jesus was always a part of his life. And although he died between two cars in a cold parking lot, he never died alone because he was with him. And from that day forward, she, she just died about a year ago, but from that day forward, 
she found comfort in that thought to know that her son did not die alone. None of us will ever die alone. Predicate on the fact that you now, and hopefully have already, invite Jesus into your life and make sure you make God a part of your life. You see, loneliness, it is debilitating. And a lot of people suffer from loneliness, more now than ever, despite the fact there's so many different types of communication processes that we could reach out and, and connect with people, but overall that is not happening. So many people are just feel isolated and alone. According to Western Pennsylvania, multi less in real estate, right now in this part of Pennsylvania, southwestern Pennsylvania, the more single dwelling homes now than ever before. So a population of a town might be going down, but the amount of homes still exists only because a home that once housed eight or nine or ten people houses just one. One potentially lonely person aside, but it doesn't have to be that way person is not lonely, despite the fact they might be living by themselves if they have invited Jesus into their life. What does it take? It takes time. You can say to yourself, I'm going to rush right into the day and not take time to pray and not say, Jesus, I need you. And, and when you exclude Christ from your life, then he's excluded from your life and yours from his. This plaque in this lady's house, I'm glad that she took a long time coming. Matter of fact, I had to go find out where she went. But I read that story. And the rite of passage for that Cherokee Indian made sense. He was never alone because his dad went there prior to his entry into the woods with the help of the tribal leader blindfolded. But the top caption says this. And this is what you want to go home with tonight. Remember this. With Jesus, you are never alone. 